welcome to the Daily Space. My name is Annie Wilson, and most weekdays, the CosmoQuest team is here putting science into your brain. Wednesdays, however, are for Rocket Roundup. Let's get to it, shall we? To get this out of the way, because I know you've all been excited about this, on February 2nd at 1825 UTC, SpaceX finally launched their SN9 vehicle from Pad Bravo at the Boca Chica launch site. We had all thought, including SpaceX, that this would happen last week. But the launch had to be delayed while SpaceX worked through public safety concerns with the FAA. One of those concerns was random people being in unsafe locations during the launch, which is a valid concern. Yesterday's launch took place after a brief hold in the count to allow the county sheriff to intercept a silver pickup truck in the restricted area. Afterwards, SN9 ascended smoothly up to 10 kilometers, shutting down engines as necessary to limit flight aerodynamic loads and stay subsonic. At Apogee, the highest point, the vehicle tilted horizontal and began maneuvering using its aero surfaces. Those are the flappy appendages at the side of the craft. At about one kilometer altitude, the vehicle reignited two of its three engines and attempted to flip back vertical for landing. Unfortunately, only one of those two engines restarted. While unburnt propellants and flaming hunks of metal were observed coming from the engine that did not reignite. This resulted in combustion instability in the engine that did not ignite properly, turning the engine's nice blue flame into a yellow color. Not a good sign. The vehicle missed its vertical as it tried to maneuver from its belly flop back upright for landing. SN9 impacted the ground at a weird angle causing uh, an explosion. So exploding and sending large pieces of metal, composite overwrought pressure vessels, and a large cloud of liquid oxygen showering in every direction. The entire flight lasted about six minutes and 26 seconds. And we have a full video linked at our website, dailyspace.org. But let's look at some highlights. Here is the video of the takeoff. The venting that you see at the bottom is normal. It's probably Ten, liquid nine, oxygen eight, just venting seven, off. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Next up, we have video of the craft at Apogee, which is the highest point. Let's try this one. All right, here it goes. Here's the video at Apogee. T plus four minutes. Vehicle is at 10 kilometers. It's apogee, it is at Apogee. We're continuing to throttle down engine number one to hold altitude. Not a whole lot to look at, I know. We're preparing for handover on the propellant tank. Four and a half minutes, we are handing off to the LOX tank. We are beginning to flip the horizontal. Into the belly flop. In the white cloud, the plume you were seeing was intentional. There is a liquid oxygen dump. We've now transitioned to horizontal and beginning the subsonic you can see the fins or the test portion of the flight. Doing a lot of work where right we now. check out the aft and the forward flaps to hold the vehicle stability as we descend back to the landing pad. And finally, finally, the very dramatic landing. C 
Six minutes, 10 seconds into flight. We're down beneath one and a half kilometers. We're preparing to restart two engines, flip the vehicle vertical, then transition to one engine for the landing burn. Let's get cameras up. Heck of a cloud it put up though, huh? As a reminder, SpaceX expects these kind of dramatic failures while they work to design and test their rockets iteratively over time. They push their systems to the limits so they can learn more about how they can fail and engineer solutions. Also, SN9 is the rocket that fell over in the high bay. This is a rocket that had to be repaired after getting smooshed into a wall. SN9 fell over, got damaged, and still flew. That is kind of awesome. After the break, we're going to bring you the latest launch attempt from China, a launch designed to amuse the internet while disappointing its builders. Stay tuned. With SN9 out of the way, let's return to our normal rundown of what has tried to go up in the last week. First up, on January 29th at 4.47 UTC, a long March for Charlie took off from Chen Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. On board was the Yaogan 31 Group 2 mission, a set of three Earth observation satellites. These will join the existing constellation of Yaogan satellites, seven of which launched in 2020. Yaogan translates to remote observing, so it makes sense that the China Academy of Space Technology stated that the new satellites will be mainly used to carry out electromagnetic environment detection and related technical tests. Not much else is publicly known about the Algan satellites, and news coverage of the launch wasn't extremely detailed. Just a brief mention of the mission and that the launch was successful. We do have a launch video, however. That's always cool. Next up, on February 1st at 8.15 UTC, a iSpace Hyperbola-1 rocket took off again from Chen Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. Unfortunately, the launch was far from successful with the vehicle going off course in a dramatic fashion shortly after liftoff. Several hours after launch, iSpace put out a press release stating that an investigation into the failure had begun. This was the second launch of a Hyperbola-1 rocket. The first launch in July 2019, also from Chen Satellite Launch Center, was successful and reportedly placed several payloads into orbit. While this was technically the second launch of a Hyperbola-1 rocket, the first and second rocket were very different. This image from Weibo user Phil Leaf shows the external differences between the two rockets. The launch vehicle seems to have been redesigned from the first flight to the second flight. The first launch vehicle, Yankee 1, was 20.8 meters tall, and the diameter tapers from 1.4 meters at the bottom to 1.2 meters at the top. Meanwhile, the second launch vehicle, Yankee 2, is taller, coming in at 24 meters tall. It has a consistent diameter of 1.4 meters. 
With all of these external changes, we can only guess that things are also different inside the rockets. One additional factor in this launch, which the internet was quick to meme, was the inclusion of Xi Bing's art on the side of the rocket. Designed to look like Chinese song style font from the Ming Dynasty, the beautiful characters actually meant nothing leading folks to make jokes along the lines that when the sky can't read your rocket, it may reject it. We'll link to more of Xi Bing's work in the show notes, and we hope to see the inclusion of more art on future missions. Xinhua News Agency previously reported that if successful, Yankee 2 would have become the first privately owned commercial launch vehicle model successfully launched in China. While this isn't a successful launch, we look forward to seeing iSpace return with a new vehicle and new launch attempts in the not too distant future. After the break, we'll be back with more launches, including one that was interrupted by a snowmobile. Stay tuned. On to our next launch on February 2nd at 2045 UTC, the Russian Space Forces successfully launched a Soyuz 2.1 Bravo from Pleshtek Cosmodrome in northern Russia. The Lotus S is part of the Liana system, which is replacing the Soviet-era Selena 2 series of satellites. This was the 1,931st launch of an R7-based Soyuz rocket since 1957. The primary mission for LOTOS is ELIT, which is short for Electronic Intelligence. To put it simply, LOTOS is a spy satellite, which is why we really don't have a lot of publicly available information to share. However, I can talk a little about ELINT in general. Basically, ELINT starts with the recording of any and all information about electronic magnetic signals the frequency, timing, duration, directions, intensities, and so on. Then you compare that data to everything else you know about the device, the hardware type it belongs to, and the military units that may possibly be using it. From there, you compare all of that information <laughs> to where it's being used and to what is going on around it, such as things like deployments or military maneuvers. From the combination of all of these things you know, you can sometimes learn very useful information, like whether or not you can translate the signals themselves. For instance, you might discover that a satellite has synthetic aperture radar capability that you didn't know about from the type of signals it emits, or you might find out which naval groups are using which signaling channels, or which particular ground stations control which military units. So why would something like this be useful? What's the point of knowing a bunch of information about the signal, but not the information in the signal? Pretend you're on a ship headed from North America to the UK during World War II. German U-boats were known to track and sink Allied ships so that the UK couldn't stockpile goods that would be needed to survive a series of land battles. The Germans were finding the Allied ships using the Allied radio signals, and the Allied ships were able to chase down or avoid U-boats because of the German radio signals. Neither side needed to know what was being communicated over the radio to achieve their aim. So, as a very last minute surprise for this launch, we actually have video. So let's take a look at this launch.
And now for something a bit different. The majority of launches we talk about on Rocket Roundup are orbital launches, but those aren't the only type of launches. Rockets can also be launched on suborbital trajectories. This means that the rocket may or may not reach space by crossing the Kármán line at 100 kilometers, but they definitely do not achieve orbit. Most suborbital launches don't attract much attention, despite their being an important part of fields of study like atmospheric research and meteorology. This past Sunday, January 31st at 2137 UTC, a small company called Blue Shift Aerospace, based in Brunswick, Maine, made rocketry history when it launched Stardust 1.0 from the Loring Commerce Center in Aroostock County in northeastern Maine. This was the first commercial launch in the state of Maine and the first commercial launch using a hybrid bio-derived fuel propellant with a liquid oxidizer. This very first rocket launch from Maine flew to roughly 5,200 feet or 1,584 meters before it returned by parachute. Some of the people in the CosmoQuest community who watched the launch together in our Discord server on Sunday said that Stardust 1.0 looked like a larger version of the Estes model rockets they built as kids, right down to the classic orange parachute. The Stardust rocket is small, just six meters in length and weighing in at 250 kilograms. Its design and size makes it relatively inexpensive to build. Combine that with a fuel that costs less per kilogram than traditional rocket fuel, is completely non-toxic and has the added benefit of being carbon neutral, and you have Stardust as an affordable option for students, researchers, and companies that want to conduct experiments in space. Now, before you ask, we don't actually know what their biofuel is made of. It's proprietary. As more is revealed, we'll bring you all the answers here on The Daily Space. So Blue Shift's goal is to develop a line of rockets powered by their proprietary bio-derived fuels to launch small satellites into space. They have plans for a second Stardust 1.0 launch in July 2021 that will also be suborbital and launches will occur every six months or so of future generations of their rockets, culminating with a model called Red Dwarf that will go to polar orbit as early as October 2024. Blue Shift's debut payload consisted of a high school experiment and tests on an alloy called nitinol developed by Kellogg Research Labs in Salem, New Hampshire. Nitinol is an alloy that remembers its shape, making it useful in medical devices such as stents. It's also used to protect payloads from vibrations. Kellogg Research Labs is heavily involved in space and they are trying to get into upcoming missions to the Mar to the moon and Mars, excuse me. The lab's founder, Joe Kellogg, says that their long-term goal is to build whole rockets out of nitinol. And yeah, we're gonna watch the entire rocket launch. So here's the whole video, the whole flight from launch to landing. It's less than a minute. Such a tiny rocket. When we come back, we'll look at the stats for this year in launches.
It is week five of 2021 and we're averaging more than a launch a week. Let's take a look at 2021 in numbers. For human spaceflight, we have five space toilets and six people in orbit with one launch. Those space toilets include three installed on the ISS, one on the Crew Dragon, and one on the Soyuz. Total 2021 orbital launch attempts so far, nine, including one failure. And total satellites from those launches, 220. I keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. USA 4, China 3, New Zealand 1, Russia 1. And your random space fact is for the week is that Sunday marked the 63rd anniversary of the first satellite launched by the USA. On January 31st, 1958, Explorer 1 was launched by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory developed the mission payload in a remarkably fast three months. According to NASA, the scientific instrument carried on Explorer 1 was a cosmic ray detector designed to measure the radiation environment in Earth orbit. Once in space, this experiment, provided by Dr. James Van Allen of the University of Iowa, revealed a much lower cosmic ray count than expected. Van Allen theorized that the instrument may have been saturated by very strong radiation from a belt of charged particles trapped in space by the Earth's magnetic field. The existence of these radiation belts was confirmed by another U.S. satellite launched two months later and became known as the Van Allen belts in honor of their discoverer. Explorer 1 transmitted for six months and decayed out of Earth orbit in March 1970, 12 years after launch. The image on the left is of the launch of Explorer 1 on its Juno 1 rocket. The Juno 1 was essentially a stretched version of the Redstone rocket that several years later would launch Alan Shepard to suborbit. The Juno 1 included a cluster of solid motors on the top to propel a satellite into orbit after the main rocket was separated. You can see this cluster of rockets in the inset image on the upper left. This cluster of solid motors played the role of upper stage engines on the Juno 1. This ad hoc second stage had 11 baby sergeant motors. The third, carried inside the second, had three baby sergeants and the fourth stage, which remained attached to Explorer 1, was a single baby sergeant motor. The upper stage was not very big, as you can see from the human provided for scale. The upper stages were spun up prior to separation from the first stage. Spins to stabilization removed the need to have a guidance system on the upper stages. Instead, a signal from the ground was sent at the right time to command the ignition of the upper stages. The image on the right is from NASA and their description reads as follows. The three men responsible for the success of Explorer 1 America's first Earth satellite, which was launched July, excuse me, January 31st, 1958. At the left is Dr. William H. Pickering, former director of JPL, which built and operated the satellite. Dr. James A. Van Allen, Center of State University of Iowa, designed and built the instrument on the Explorer that discovered the radiation belts which circle the Earth. At the right is Dr. Warner Von Braun, the leader of the Army's Redstone Arsenal team, which built the first stage Redstone rocket that launched Explorer 1. In the middle is the NASA seal dating back to when NASA was formed in October 1958. We've come a long way in 63 years. Heck, we've come a long way in this past week with SpaceX's S9 and Blue Shift's launch from Maine. Space is hard, but awesome advances are happening, and we'll report them as they happen. This has been The Daily Space.